Bienvenidos todos a este seminario debate con el profesor Adam Jaffe. Welcome everyone to this debate and seminar with Professor Adam Jaffe uh, from Brandeis University, uh, who is a star in the field of economics of innovation, and it's an honor for us to have him here. Research, uh, professor Adam Jaffe is research professor as, at Brandeis University, senior lecturer at, lecturer at the Sloan, Sloan School of Management at MIT. Uh, he has a background on chemistry from MIT, PhD in economics from Harvard with uh, supervisor uh, Svi Grilikes, uh, uh, someone who was the pioneer in, the, in this field for everyone working on patent and research data. He is editor of Research Policy, chair of the U.S. National Academy's Board on Science, Technology, and Economic Policy, and principal investigator for the Sloan Foundation, funded iCube. Do you pronounce it iCube? iCube. I, yeah, we haven't quite agreed. <laughs> iCube or i3 or i3 something. initiative to share information uh, and create standards for patent analysis with the objective to estimate research impact and uh, any, any other uh, policy implication that research uh, and patent data can inform us. Adam Jaffe is the author of more than 100 scientific articles, but uh, this, uh, this is not enough to describe his influence because he is uh, one of the most cited economists in the world in economics of innovation and energy, because energy and environment is another field he has done research on. He has in research uh, in Google Scholar, for example, which is not perfect, I know, <laughs> almost 70,000 citations. He was a keynote speaker at the European Policy for Intellectual Property uh, Association conference that I organized uh, with colleagues uh, from Bordeaux and uh, Amsterdam and other, other places in uh, September in Madrid, the EPIP 2021 conference. But he couldn't come last September, so we uh, postponed the trip and now he's here with us. In September, he presented a paper on patent metrics for innovation research, an overview, uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see the video of his plenary there. And today, he will present a paper called The Matthew Effect and Intrinsic Quality in Patent Citation Networks. And I don't want to delay more his presentation. We will have a debate afterwards with uh, the Vice President uh, of CSIC uh, for Research, Scientific and Technological Research, uh, moderated uh, by Luis Sanz, a research professor at the Institute of Public, uh, in Public Goods and Policies, where I'm also a scientist. And we have uh, people watching online on YouTube and uh, people here on site. So I hope the debate in about 40, 45 minutes mm -hmm. when the seminar finishes is active and we receive a lot of questions and we, we can uh, get a broad uh, debate on implications of, uh, of this research. But before giving the word to Professor Jaffe, I, I also wanted to say that in, in these moments uh, where we are seeing uh, so, so terrible things on the news uh, from Ukraine and Russia, we, we also want to contribute a condemn with a, our condemn to the war and uh, solidarity with the people from Ukraine and uh, we offer our small support uh, from here, even moral support, but we, we hope to do more. Adam, your turn. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Catalina, and, and the Institute for inviting me. Uh, this is my first visit to Madrid. Uh, and in case you're worried, I did come in yesterday when it was not raining. It was a beautiful day. So I, I enjoyed walking around uh, the city yesterday and had a lovely time. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some work that I did um, together with uh, several physicists in New Zealand when I spent five years working in New Zealand. And I, when we get to it, I'll sort of tell you about how that collaboration came about. Um, but let me um, start by saying that th the talk I'm going to give is in some ways fairly technical and sort of narrow in, in what we actually look at. Um, but we think of it and the motivation for it 
is that we think of it as a special case of a broader phenomenon which we think is actually quite important beyond just patents and, and citations. And I want to illustrate that by just thinking about some other questions that really have nothing to do with what we're going to talk about um, to sort of give you a sense of the broader context in which we see this, this analysis. So, you know, think about fame or popularity and, and what is its relationship to, to quality in some sense? You know, we, you, you, everybody's talking about a certain restaurant. That, that increases the chance that you will want to go there, right, if you hear that everyone else is going to this restaurant. Now, presumably, that's not just because you want to do what everyone else is doing. Presumably, it's because you think that if everyone else is going there, that's sending some information. That's telling you something about the restaurant, hopefully, that good food. Um, but, you know, how that phenomenon works is actually not obvious and, and interesting to think about how that develops. It's a dynamic phenomenon that is developing over time. Uh, involving communication and relationships between different agents talking to each other. And, and that's the kind of thing that we're sort of thinking about here. So maybe a little bit closer to home, you know, if you think about big journals like Science or Nature, you know, they have a high impact factor. They're important journals. Why is that? Is that because they are really good at choosing the best papers? Is it because they have a high impact factor and as a result of their high impact factor, the best scientists send them their papers and therefore, that's why they publish the best papers, which then maintains their high impact factor. That's probably part of it. Or could it just be, and I'm not suggesting that I think it is this third one, but conceptually, it could just be a self-sustaining fad, right, we would say in English. It could just be a completely, uh, a, a bubble, uh, something that does not have any real basis, that somehow you get a high impact factor, so everybody reads the journal, and because everybody's reading the journal, the papers in the journal get cited more, and that maintains the high impact factor. And in principle, you could write down a mathematical model in which that would occur without there being any, any real difference uh, in the paper. So that's the kind of phenomenon that we're, we're broadly thinking about here. Uh -oh. uh, two different people publish an equally good paper, but the one by a famous person is noticed by more people. Um, it could be psychological, that if everybody's telling you, you know, Catalina tells me I'm great, that makes me feel good, and so I, I work harder and I, and I write better papers. Uh, or it could be institutional, like the restaurant getting an oven. If you're a scientist, it's not an oven, but there are other instruments that you need, and, and that could come from, from success. Um, so that's, that's, that's part of our background here. Okay, now let me start to focus in on the data and, and talk a little bit about patent citations. Now, I think some of you know this, but some of you may not. So just quickly, let me give you uh, a sense of, of what we're doing here and why we're working with patents and patent citations. So we think of the rate at which an inventor or a firm or a region produces patents as a noisy indicator of the actual, the real inventive output of people or firms or regions. And any individual patent uh, has a value, which could mean a lot of different things, but, but roughly speaking, it could be its economic value, it could be its technological significance. And the, pat the value of patents is very variable and highly skewed. So most patents are worthless to anybody and anything. They never amount to anything, but a very small um, and it's also correlated with subjective assessments. There are various people who've made lists of the 100 greatest inventions of the 20th century. And if you look at those, that being on one of those lists is correlated with being a highly cited patent. Um, and the, the distribution of, across patents of these citations is highly skewed. And, and this very skewed citation distribution is seen by people as sort of being appropriately related somehow to the skewed distribution of, of value. So we're gonna then focus in on these patent citations and study the dynamic process by which they, by which they arrive. Um, so um, if we think about this, you know, basically this idea of success breeds success is, is a dynamic process. But when you just say success breeds success, you don't answer the question, where does the first success come from, right? Uh, how, how does this get started? Uh, now, you can imagine if you just think of this mathematically, writing down a model, you could have identical 
attractors, either scientists or patents, who are of absolutely indistinguishable quality, uh, if, the, if the first citation or the first recognition is random, you could have a process in which there's a random early arrival which then just beads on, feeds on itself. And so you get this success breeding success based on just luck of the early um, arrival. And you can write down a model in which that kind of process will generate the skewed distributions that we observe empirically. Uh, sort of on the other side, sort of you can think of a model in which we have very heterogeneous attractors. We have some great scientists and some not so great scientists, some really fundamentally intrinsically significant inventions and some other stupid ideas. And all that's really going on is that the good ones get cited and the bad ones don't. And that happens continuously over time. And that will also generate the kind of skewed distributions that we observe empirically. So what we're, the, the essence of this paper is trying to say, OK, in a, in a purely hypothetical theoretical world, either of these quite different ways of thinking about what's going on can both generate sort of what we observe. Are there ways empirically to, to peel this apart and see if we can say which of these is more important or are they both going on? That's essentially what the paper does. It's hard, and we don't solve it completely. Uh, and as I said, we're looking at a very specific, arguably sort of narrow case of this, but we think the phenomenon is, is broader, uh, and maybe the kinds of approach that we're using could be applied to the broader phenomenon. Okay, so how did this come about? This is, I'll just tell this story because I think you might be interested in, to, in it. Um, so I had previously done a bunch of work on modeling citations, uh, working with another economist, and basically we had a model in which the arrival of citations to a patent is a process which is governed by two things. It's governed by diffusion of knowledge, which causes the patent to become better known over time, combined with obsolescence. So once you've made an invention, uh, the, the movement of the, the field over time makes that invention less relevant because other people have done better things and more important things and your idea is gradually becoming less important. So if you have these two phenomena going on at the same time, what you find is that that can generate a time pattern for citations, which seems to fit pretty well what we observe empirically for citations. Now, in parallel, physicists and people who work on networks in other fields had modeled citations resulting from a process they call preferential attachment, which is just a different piece of jargon for the same idea. Um, you can think of this as a pure Matthew effect. Literally, you just assume that your probability of citation at time t is an increasing function of how many citations you've gotten to date. And if, if that's how citations arrive, again, that will generate a time path for citations that somewhat fits the empirical data. So, um, I was involved in an interdisciplinary center in New Zealand where I met a bunch of physicists and you know we started talking about this and uh, we said well wouldn't it be interesting to see if we could sort of combine these two approaches and and model it sort of taking into account um, both of these ways of thinking about it so that's what we did so let me briefly review each of this approaches separately and then I'll explain how we brought them together so the economic approach, as I mentioned, is this combination of diffusion and obsolescence. And, in, and our model is very simple. We have two exponential processes. We have an increasing exponential, that's diffusion. And we have a decreasing exponential, that's obsolescence. And we assume that the probability of citation at any moment t is proportional to the product of these two exponentials, one of which is rising over time and one of which is falling over time. And if you make that assumption, um, what it produces is uh, a curve that rises and then falls. And I'll show you this empirically in a second. So what, to make it an empirical model, we say that the diffusion rate uh, basically depends on uh, the proximity in space, geographic and technological space. So if I have an idea, 
the probability that you have learned about it within some fixed time period depends on how close you are to me geographically and, and how close you are to me sort of technologically. If you're working on the same things I'm working on, you're more likely to have heard about my work than otherwise. And if, and if we live in the same city, you're more likely to have heard about it. Um, and uh, then the obsolescence process is purely a function of time. The, the passage of time causes uh, patents to become more obsolete. So we got a bunch of patent data and we sort of estimated models based on this and they generate curves that look like this. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. So it, it just the, the y-axis, the actual units don't really matter. Just think of it as sort of probability of citation somehow normalized. And what you see is over time, you get these hump-shaped curves because eventually the obsolescence dominates but in the early years, the diffusion process dominates. And we're looking here at patents that came from the US. And so the probability of citation is highest for other coming from other US patents. That's the top. If I stand up and point at this, can people on the video actually see me? Do we know? If I stand up like this, are people seeing me point? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is the US, which is the highest curve because it's the closest people. And then here we have Canada, which is pretty close to the US. And then this is uh, the Europe and Japan. So you see that the probability of citation at any lag depends on your geographic proximity, but they all have this characteristic rising and then falling pattern. Um, and then if we look at this by technology fields, what we see is that Diffusion is fast, relatively, in electronic-related fields, and is slow in drugs. So you get a, a, a later peak in drugs than in electronics. But again, over, eventually, all of these processes become uh, sort of hyperbolic, and uh, the citation rate trends, tends towards zero. OK, now let me turn to the sort of physicist model. Uh, sort of a reinterpretation of the same phenomenon. What we'll say is that we have a patent which at, at some time t has accumulated to date k citations. And what we're going to say in this model is that uh, the rate at which um, uh, or the probability of being cited at time t, which is this lambda of k and t, uh, it depends on two things. It depends on obsolescence. Again, very similar to the previous model of obsolescence, a, a, decline, a decreasing function in time. And it depends on accumulated citation. So this is the part that's different. And this is going to be a power function. F of k is a power function in k. So this is the preferential attachment process. And we can have this power function be of different orders, which makes the preferential attachment stronger or, or weaker. Um, and compared to the economist model, basically we have the same way of looking at obsolescence, but instead of this diffusion process, uh, we have this preferential attachment process, uh, uh, which is a power function in K. OK, now, so we're going to try to estimate this model that combines these two things. And the way we do it is we take, again, US patents in particular technology classes. So we're sort of comparing apples to apples. Um, and then uh, we normalize the rate of arriving citations by the rate at which all patents in that field are cited. So we're not, we're not allowing changes in the outside world to affect the probability of citation. We want it really to be as much as possible just a function of these two phenomenon related to the invention. And we estimate the fitness model uh, uh, based. So we estimate the obsolescence and the preferential attachment just looking at how the citations arrive over time. And then we estimate fitness the way we're going to bring the, the fitness into it. Did I skip a step? Sorry. I, I forgot to say one thing. Very. I forgot to say one extremely important thing. So the. I told you that the A of t is obsolescence, which is the same as we had before. The F of k is the preferential attachment. And then we have this eta i. And you notice that does not depend on time. 
that only depends on the invention. So this is what in the in the uh, sort of physicists call this fitness. Uh, we might call it quality. This is the intrinsic significance, really, of the invention. It doesn't vary over time. It's intrinsic to the invention. So we actually have three things going on now, not just two things. We've got fitness, we've got obsolescence, and we've got preferential attachment. These two are going to be estimated based on the time pattern. And this is going to be estimated by taking a whole bunch of things that we know about the patent at the time it's granted and using factor analysis to reduce that multi-dimensional characterization of the invention to a one-dimensional quality measure. And we're going to see how that affects the probability of citation. At the same time, it's being affected by obsolescence and fitness. Okay? If you're, if you're skeptical that that all really works, uh, that's a sensible skepticism. It kind of works. OK, so uh, sorry I skipped that step the first time. So as I said, the fitness is based on factor analysis, obsolescence, and preferential attachment. Essentially, if you think about this from a generic data analysis point of view, and if I look at a moment in time and I say, well, how likely is this patent to be cited that moment in time. That's a function of three things. It's a function of something intrinsic about the invention. It's a function of how many citations the patent has gotten before. And it's a function of how much time has elapsed. And those three things are all correlated, but they're not exactly the same thing. So that's why we have some hope of empirically distinguishing the three things in that way. OK, so to show you what we get, I'm going to start with a model that ignores the fitness part of it. So let's start by saying, just assume that the patents are intrinsically all the same. And just think about preferential attachment and obsolescence. And what you get is something like this. So this is accumulated citations up to a certain point in time. Uh, this is basically the probability of citation in the next instant. And the different curves are at different points in time. So the first thing you see, if you just look, for example, at the red line, after three years, uh, the probability of citation is an increasing function of how much you've been cited before. So that's the preferential attachment. And you notice this curve has a slight upward slope. That's the power function. So it's not just the more citations you have, the more you're cited, but actually the exponent in that relationship is greater than one. Uh, and then if we think about nine years, so six years later, for the same number of previous citations, your probability of getting cited is lower. That's the obsolescence. So this picture shows you preferential attachment in the upward sloping nature of every line. And it shows you obsolescence in the ordering of the lines. That as time goes by for a given previous number of citations, you have a lower probability of citation than the next instant. We can take the same result and just flip it around and look at it the other way by looking. Now we have time here, and the different curves are different levels of previous citation. And first of all, let me just start with the simpler part of this. You can see that for the highly cited patents at any given point in time, they're more likely to get cited in the next instance. So for example, think of it a patent, some random patent that after five years has 25 citations, this is its probability of being cited in the next instant. A patent that after five years has only three citations has a much lower probability of citation in the next instant. So that's the preferential attachment. And then these curves are downward sloping. That's obsolescence. There is this interesting phenomenon uh, that at every level of citation, um, the obsolescence process does, appears to be not purely exponential, which is what we were kind of imagining. So if it was purely exponential, these would be straight lines. And what we see is that after, say, three years or so, it, it does appear to be very exponential. Um, but there's this interesting phenomenon that the, the obsolescence rate, it sort of accelerates. It, it's like, the obsolescence doesn't set in right away 
at an exponential rate. Uh, we don't we don't have a real explanation for this, but it's it's quite persistent in the data. So it could be something about so this model no longer explicitly has diffusion in it. So it could be something about diffusion that in these early years, um, the, the citations are really not coming from a diffusion process. They're coming from like people who just automatically know about what's going on. In the, like the, if you think about a citation after six months, maybe that's not it took six months for the knowledge to diffuse and then the citation occurred. Maybe it's they knew about it right away and just because they're in the same group in some sense, maybe, or something. We don't really know. But it is, it is a persistent uh, in the data. OK, now let's um, bring the fitness into this. So we're going to take things we know about the patent from the patent office at the moment the patent is granted. Uh, and as I indicated, we're going to use this factor analysis to sort of, I'll show you this, actually maybe it's better if I just show you. So here's, the, here's the, the list of things we know about a patent at the date it was granted. And this is very much a kitchen sink sort of empirical approach. We're not, this is not an, a model. Uh, so we know how many citations it made to other patents, how many citations it made to other patents granted to the same firm. We know how many citations it made to foreign patents. How many citations it made to scientific articles? Uh, is it citing old work or more recent work? Is it citing old work that itself is highly cited? Or is it citing old work that nobody else has been paying any attention to? Um, the number of claims in the patent, which is a legal aspect of sort of how broad the invention is, how many, how many different types of things is, are covered by the patent. How many inventors were there on the patent? Were there, was this an invention that took 20 people to produce it, or was this one guy, uh, one person? Um, what technology class is it in? Um, what's called originality, which is, is, are the patents that it's citing very technologically diverse, or are they all very similar? Um, how long did it take the patent office to decide whether or not to grant this patent? We could talk about that. That's kind of an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. And then, the number of figures in the patent document, which other people have found to be related to the technological significance of the invention. So this is, as I say, really a sort of a kitchen sink. And what we do is we take a pile of data that we're not going to use in the subsequent analysis, and we regress citations on all of these things. And then we use factor analysis to come up with sort of a best prediction of citations based on all of these things using the data from the sample that's not going to be part of our other analysis. So it's a way of sort of trying to come up with a sort of intrinsic measure of the quality of a patent in terms of that might predict its future citations independent of time and, and other things. Okay? And then so what we have then is a, a, a number, a normalized number for each patent, which is sort of an index of its quality or its fitness. And now we're going to throw that in the mix with time and accumulated citations. Um, and so if we go then, um, I there was another, these are not in the order I thought they were in. So let me try to just do them in the order that I thought I was going to make. That's probably my mistake in the PowerPoint. But um, OK. So here, if we look at, this is similar to the graph we looked at a second ago. for. For patents at five years, we're looking at how the probability of citation varies with accumulated citations. And you've got two lines here, one of which includes this fitness parameter, so we've normalized by the fitness. And one, this is the blue dots are sort of the line you saw before. Before we had an upward sloping line like this, which was the preferential attachment effect. And what we see is when we put in fitness, the line pivots slightly downward. So the preferential attachment phenomenon is still there, but it's mitigated. It's reduced somewhat by controlling for fitness. So what we're saying is that um, both phenomena seem to be empirically important, that 
even in the presence of our fitness measure, you still observe a preferential attachment phenomenon. Even controlling for the intrinsic quality of the patent, it's still true that knowing the accumulated citations helps you predict future citations. Um, okay. Uh, and then uh, if we look at uh, how strong the preferential attachment function is as a function of time, what we find is that it sort of settles in, it rises in the early years and then settles in, and it never goes away. So there, if you, you might have thought um, when an invention is new and people don't know much about it, um, knowing how many citations it's gotten might be a very important way of predicting how good it is and how many citations it's going to get in the next period. But you might have thought eventually that shouldn't really matter, that everything there is to know about this invention becomes known, and it shouldn't really matter uh, what the, uh, what, how many citations it's gotten. But, and if we were truly controlling for intrinsic fitness, you might think then you wouldn't have a preferential attachment phenomenon after some period of time. We find in our data it does not go away, at least up to 10 years. Now, let me go back. I thought this picture was later. This, I, my, my, the graduate student who did most of the work in this paper, Kyle, made this picture, and he loves this picture. And I get scared every time I try to present it, because I'm always afraid I'm not really going to be able to explain it. Um, but what this picture is, is on the x-axis here, we have basically uh, percentiles of, this, of the fitness parameter. So this corresponds to the highly, the, what the data say are the really good patents. These are the really lousy patents. And then the y-axis is frequency of citation, again, by percentile. So these are, these are the patents that get very few citations. And these are the patents that get a lot of citations. Okay? And then what each of these lines does, let's start with the blue dots, is it says, let's look at one of these percentiles and ask and identify within the patents that have that fitness the median patent in terms of number of citations. And ask the question, where does that patent, which is median for this percentile in citations, where does it lie in the overall citation distribution of patents? So what this says, for example, is if I take a patent whose fitness is pretty high, and I identify the median patent in terms of citations in, within those pretty good fitness patents, that patent is better than 70% of all patents in terms of its citations. And if I go all the way out to the very best, most fit patents, the median patent in that distribution is better than 90% of all patents in terms of its citations. So that's confirming that fitness does relate to citation problems. If fitness were everything, if, if there were a perfect correlation between fitness as we measure it at time of grant and citations, by the way, this is all after 10 years, so we've normalized for time. All you would observe here is one straight line that goes from zero to one. Because if there were a perfect match between fitness and citation probability, then if I told you I've got a patent that's in the 80th percentile for fitness, you would know it's in the 80th percentile. It has to be in the 80th percentile for citations if fitness is the only thing and it perfectly predicts uh, citations. But of course, that's not what we find. What we find is we do have generally upward sloping lines and also you know, rising lines. So at any level of fitness, within that fitness, the, the patents uh, are, are, so if I take example, a, a patent that is for a given fitness. Please get control over that meeting for a second. Um, so at the 90, this would be the, this would be the patents that are the 95th percentile for quality within the percentile. And of course, they're at the, for the high fitness patents, they're at 95th percentile of all patents. But even so, if I take a patent of the worst fitness, the highly cited patents within that um, group are highly cited across all patents. They're not 
it's not up here, but it's still pretty high. So thinness is not explaining everything, but it's explaining some things. Okay, so let me go back. And let's, let's sort of wrap up with what we think we learned from this. So I could probably sit down. So essentially what we find is that preferential attachment is there and doesn't go away even after we control for fitness. Uh, and uh, fitness does seem to matter, but doesn't make preferential attachment go away. Now, you're probably thinking, I hope you're thinking, if you've done any empirical work at all, that I don't know the true fitness of these inventions. All I have is a estimated fitness based on a grab bag of things that the patent office tells me about the invention at the time it's granted. So you might say, well, if you really knew the true fitness, maybe it would explain everything. Maybe preferential attachment would go away. The only reason preferential attachment doesn't go away is because you're measuring fitness imperfectly, and the citations contain additional information that your measures don't have. And that's why. So if you want to be a believer in intrinsic quality, and you don't want to think that, that uh, citations, predict citations in and of themselves, I can't really reject that view based on what I've done because I have only an imperfect measure of, of fitness. And, um, you know, you could think, and I think many people do think, that um, there's, and, and there's really two different kinds of ways in which my measure is imperfect. Even at the moment of grant, it's imperfect. And then as time goes by, people are learning things about the quality of the invention. And they're not necessarily learning those things by observing the citation distribution. They may be learning those things by their everyday experience with the invention. Um, and that may have nothing to do with citations. So for both of those reasons, um, you know, I can't claim to have really uh, captured all of the effects of fitness. Uh, now, we do have this phenomenon that the preferential attachment effect increases as time elapses. And this seems to suggest that sort of intuitively, it seems to make sense that even controlling for time, so you're looking apples to apples, if I compare two patents after three years, let's say I have a patent and Catalina has a patent. And after three years, her patent has more citations than mine. Um, you know, you might say, okay, that may suggest her, her patent is better than mine. If after 10 years her patent has more citations than mine, you might think, well, that's actually more information. So you'd be more confident in some sense that that means that her patent is better. So the fact that, this pref that the preferential attachment phenomenon seems to increase for a while, for like five or six years, could be saying, Observing citations after three or four or five years gives you some information, but not great information. After some number of years, five, six, ten, not sure how many, the citations get about as good as they ever get in terms of a predictor. So you don't, you don't know more by knowing how many citations it got after 20 years than you did by looking after 10 years, but you do know more after 10 years than it tells you after five years. So that's, that's our interpretation. Um, now, just mention one other fact in this whole area to think about is I have this other work that I did with Bronwyn Hall and Manuel Trachtenberg, which I alluded to obliquely earlier, where we looked at the relationship between the market value of firms, the stock market value of firms, and the citation intensity of the patents that the firm owns. And we found that there is a relationship. So the stock market, in evaluating sort of the, you can think of it as the technological capital of the firm, whatever evaluation the stock market is doing is correlated with how highly cited the patents are. And interestingly, what we find is that if you look at the stock market value at point T in time, it's correlated with how many patents, sorry, how many citations the patents will eventually get. So, it, that's consistent. We can't really prove that this is what's going on, but that's consistent with saying that the, the world at large knows stuff about inventions that isn't yet reflected in their citations, 
but is eventually reflected in citations as time passes. Uh, so I think that's probably a reasonable description of what's going on here. Okay. Um, let me wrap up by just moving now to a little bit more about the, the significance of this work. Um, so I started by saying, you know, this is pretty narrow. Why, you know, patent citations, who cares besides Catalina and me? Who cares about patent citations? Um, so we might want to think about how does this relate to science, which is sort of something we all other people care about. Um, and the first thing you have to recognize is that patent citations occur in a legal environment that is different than the environment that generates paper citations. And it's probably the case that that environment um, makes, uh, uh, I say increases the role of fitness rep relative to preferential attachment. Um, what I mean by that is that because the patent citations come from the examiner, they don't come primarily from the author, and there is a legal standard by which they are generated rather than just sort of you wrote a paper and you thought you should cite me and somebody else and so you did. It, you'd think that that would make the connection between fitness and citation stronger. It would make it more likely that the citation really does represent something intrinsic about the invention. I can't prove that, but that, that would be my sense. And then, so that would suggest that papers would have sort of a higher level of uh, preferential attachment um, and, you know, to think, I just say to think about that, uh, why are you here today or listening to me on YouTube? Uh, you know, maybe it's because Catalina told you to come, but it may be because you know of my other work. So it's not, if you think about it, the citations that a scientific paper gets are a function not just of that paper, but of the other papers that that author has written. So that's like a higher level, when I say high, this is a poorly worded PowerPoint, when I say higher level preferential attachment, I don't mean a bigger number. I mean in a meta sense, a higher level. So the probability that a paper gets cited probably depends not just on its previous citations, but on the previous citations of its author's other papers. And that phenomenon probably doesn't exist for patents. I wouldn't think that the patents, the citations that a patent gets have any relationship to the citations that other patents by that inventor. Because the examiner is, is doing a search, following certain procedures. He's not even particularly looking at who the inventor is. Um, and so I would conjecture, again, I haven't done the analysis, but I would conjecture that there are reasons why you would think the relative significance of fitness and preferential attachment in papers Relatively speaking, preferential attachment would be more important relative to fitness than what we found in, in patents. But I, I don't really know, but that's just some thinking about how the phenomenon would be. Um, okay, so you know, what, where could you go with this? If we, if we take this notion of fitness seriously, and we also accept that it, it, isn't, it really could evolve over time, it isn't fixed at the moment an invention is born, I'm not sure you could ever completely disentangle that from preferential attachment, even as a conceptual matter with, with you know, ideal data. Because what's happening is with preferential attachment, these citations are accumulating over time, and they're telling people something about that invention. If you want to, if you want to conjecture, which I think is plausible, that other sources of information are also accumulating over time, and it may not be citations, but how would you know? How would you, unless you had metrics of that other information accumulation, I don't know that you'd ever really separate these things. Somewhat related to that, I should be clear that I'm not, there's nothing in here about causality. This is all just associations. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that uh, preferential attachment should be interpreted, that it, it, it is the count of the previous citations per se, which is causing the next citation. That is, that is probably not true. The accumulated citations are standing in for something about what is known about this invention, which is correlated with the, with the um, next uh, citation. Um, for those of you who know other work that I and others have done with citations, where we think about citations as telling us something about where knowledge flows, and how it flows across time and space. 
that isn't really in here. This is sort of like, this isn't co directly connected to that literature, which I've said in my epic talk, I think is a weakness of this literature, that we have these two different ways we talk about citations that we don't really connect together. And I think more generally, um, these network approaches are really interesting, um, but there's, a, there's sort of a disconnect between the agents and the networks. So we think about the properties of the network as somehow affecting what's going to happen to the agents. Um, and, the, and at the same time, the properties of the network are the result of the actions of the agents. But we don't do a very good job of really modeling how the agents become a network. Like what, what makes the activities of the agents generate these emergent properties of the network as a whole? We, we tend to sort of have these two different ways of looking at it, both of which have insights, but they don't rigorously connect to one to the other. We don't really model the processes by which the actions of the agents uh, manifest uh, in the network. OK, thank you. So I think the idea now is to talk about anything we want to talk about, including things generated by the paper, but also other things if, if, we get, if they seem interesting. Exactly. Free debate. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, now we will move to the debate. Uh, in the debate, we will have first uh, a set of comments from Jesus Marco, uh, Vice President for Scientific and Technical Research of the CSAC, and then again comments from uh, Catalina Martinez, uh, uh, and then interactions with Adam, and then we will try to collect some uh, comments and questions from, from the audience. Um, I will uh, ask try, uh, to be yes concise. Uh, the comments uh, no more than 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes maximum. Uh, then it's your turn, Jesus. that you give, if I understood well, you have fitness as a measure of uh, how good really the patent is, okay, what's the real potential, let's say. But what about the weight of, uh, you have thought about the expectation, or the, I, I would link this with the fashion. Uh, this uh, really, I know, happens in, in science, when scientists uh, think they are discovering a new line of research, and this has a lot of potential, and they, they put a lot of effort there, even if eventually it's not supported by, by real facts. Eh? Mm -hmm. so, and uh, this you already also told in your, in your talk about uh, the psychological point of view. Okay? How important is this? And then there's a, another point that I, I would like also for you to comment. is the, the importance of regulation. You told that there's a difference with research as is the point of regulation, let's say, or legal, um, the legal constraints that say that uh, because this this field is not so open as for uh, uh, papers, uh, here you have a lot of rest restriction. And and uh, going more to the maybe to the core of, of your talk is um, and connecting is your impression about well, it's uh, reputation is the the key word for me reputation. Mm -hmm. So you told us that uh, there's no, you expect not so much correlation with previous citation of patents, of previous patents of, of the same inventor. 
But it is true that when we look to the um, patients, uh, I think we, we say, oh, okay, this, kind, this comes from IBM team, okay, and this has an impact, no, I, I think. This also happens in research, so, mm -hmm. in, in papers. So, what do you think is the, the, the impact of this, let's say, reputation? That I know it's, well, I would say it's fitness, reputation, and expectations, these three points I see that you basically restrict basically to two, if I am, if I am right. And then, uh, um, then a, a last question that is very practical and is, given all this, what can we do to improve um, as a research institution that uh, writes patents? What is the practical lesson? Um, should we try to uh, make our patents uh, more cited just by making them more, some publicity or, or what is your r recipe for this? Or maybe we should Try that the fitness of our patents improves, or what if you have any idea there? And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think it's well. If you like to comment first, uh, and then. Well, maybe briefly react. respond, and then we can have a more general. Um, yes. So I think. Um, Thank you, Jesus, for those comments. And, and you, you're, you're hitting at, you know, uh, the limits of the modeling that we're doing uh, very much, uh, which is important. In terms of expectation, the way I would look at it is uh, if your goal is to understand uh, the value of inventions and also to understand the strengths and weaknesses of citations as a metric of that value, expectation is extremely important. And, and for example, my, my mentioning the work we did on market value, uh, market value is a forward-looking measure. So, so it is very much based on expectation. And what we're, what we're saying is that eventually the citations a patent gets uh, get as good as the market in, in predicting the future, but not, not initially. Uh, so I think it's, it is definitely a limitation of citations as a measure of value, and it diminishes over time. So, so for a 10-year-old invention, the expectations about the future, their importance relative to what's already known is less. For a brand new invention, in some sense, it's all expectation, and so, that's, that's related to my comment about citations being sort of containing more information as time passes. Uh, so I think, um, you know, that's, that's how I see the relationship. In, in, as, a, as a functional matter, at the moment a citation is made or not made, I don't think expectation comes into play particularly because you're not, you're looking backwards at that point. You're saying, do I need to cite this? patent or not, and the extent to which something in the future might affect that is, I think, second order. Uh, but I think it's very important in terms of understanding sort of the, the information content of the citations because they are, in a sense, backward looking. Uh, and I'll come back to that to get to the practicality. I think reputation is, is very much here, and, and I think of, um, in some sense, the preferential attachment phenomenon is sort of a manifestation of reputation. Uh, and, and that's, and, and what we don't know, and this goes back to the restaurant or any other example you want to use, is to what extent are good reputations earned and to what extent are they sort of random but then self-sustaining, I think is an interesting question. Now in terms of the practical consequences, I, I, I'm going to disappoint you uh, by being honest. <laughs> um, I'm not sure the practical consequences are, are great. I, I think that the main practical consequence is not so much in advising, you know, a research manager how to write better patents as much as to the extent that you do want to use uh, uh, scientometric measures of which patent citations are one example as uh, an evaluative tool to try to say, well, is, you know, is this group good or bad, or getting better or getting worse? 
Um, understanding the processes that generate these citations is, I think, quite important. Uh, and so the insights like um, recognizing that uh, uh, using citations as a measure of quality is going to be more reliable the more time has passed, up to maybe 10 years or so. I think that's the kind of practical insight. I think in terms of how do I write better patents, I, I don't know that this really helps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I think it's, uh, it's, it's clear. We should not take citations on windows of two or, or three years in, to assess the quality of the contributions of the colleagues. I think it's a lesson that could be extended to our fields of uh, assessing the quality of uh, colleagues or the peers. Catalina, now is uh, the turn of your comments and questions. Thank you. Yes. I, I noted four, four comments or questions, but uh, very fast because I, I would like to have a broader debate uh, mm -hmm. also with everyone. The first one is in your fitness index, there is also citation data, like backward citations or mm -hmm. papers cited with pedigree. So I was wondering if rather than doing a skin, what did you say, a sink back or something? Kitchen sink. It's a kitchen yes. sink <laughs> of everything. If you could uh, separate in the fitness, mm. fitness that is citation related and fitness that it's not. It's like uh, the number of inventors or all the other, the originality, all the other things that are not related to what bibliometricians call, I think, the traffic or the trade of citations. Yeah. And then uh, the other thought uh, that I had while you were speaking is that you are using uh, United USPTO data, but in European Patent Office data, we have <laughs> a very good uh, uh, analysis tool. It's the type of citations, type A, type X, type Y. And I have studied that with Dominique Gelec and Pluvia Zuniga in a paper. And uh, yeah. it's very useful because yeah. the type A uh, citations are like the fundamental state of the art that you cite and not really the conflicting art. So that could also help separate. Then my third thought uh, is the outliers. Like you said that if I patent something at the same time like you, uh, and we have two patents and mine uh, is cited more than yours, which I don't think it will happen, but if it happens, <laughs> mm -hmm. that would be an outlier, I think, signaling, oh, I signaling the quality of that work uh, from someone who is not as well known. <laughs> and uh, maybe outliers can give you information on intrinsic quality. and. The last comment <laughs> is um, uh, when we study patents from companies, uh, we have the market uh, value, the stock market, and all this aggregated information. And my question would be for public research institutions or for uh, universities, what would be the equivalent to the stock market valuation uh, that uh, we could use uh, as a predictor uh, using the aggregation, so the law of large numbers? And I enjoyed, enjoyed very much the presentation. Um, well, thank you. Those are all uh, great ideas. Uh, um, since I'm not going to write another paper as I sit here, let me just briefly come in on each of them. I think your observation about fitness possibly excluding the citation measures is, in a sense, an interesting one. You know, where we were coming from in writing this paper was trying to say, is it possible if you hit it with everything you've got, is it possible to make preferential attachment go away? That was kind of where we were coming from. So we didn't want to exclude anything because we were trying to make the fitness measure as powerful as we possibly could make it. And even including these citation-related measures, which you might argue is sort of giving fitness too much fuel, we still don't make preferential attachment go away. You know, so from our perspective, that was kind of why we did it the way we did it. I do think it would be interesting if what you want to do is measure fitness, mm -hmm. is it different if you exclude those measures? And I will shamelessly uh, pitch another paper with uh, Ed Kyle, Pigham, mm -hmm. the PhD student who uh, worked on this paper, 
and Gaetan de yep. Rosenfoss, who, so Kyle left New Zealand to do a postdoc in Switzerland with Gaetan. And as a result of that, he and Gaetan and I had wrote another paper, which is focused on measuring fitness, although in that paper we call it quality. Because, and that came out in research policy last year. And we look at every different way that people have thought about trying to measure patent quality and analyze, you know, are they, do they really all tell you the same thing or not? And the answer is they do not. They're actually, the, the, the correlation between different ways of measuring patent quality with different metrics is surprisingly low and surprisingly variable across technology fields. So, so if you ask, like, does family size, the number of countries in which the patent protection has been sought, is that correlated with the number of citations? The answer is, in some technology fields, that correlates. And another technology so That's a subsequent paper, which uh, I think speaks to your, your your insight. And the European patent office, you're exactly right. There's more information there. And so if your goal is to measure, think about measuring fitness, you'd want to use that additional information. Now your comment about the outliers I really like, and, and let me let me restate it. I think this is what you're saying, is wholly aside from this mission of trying to model the whole process. There's something intrinsically really interesting. If you can identify a patent which based on other things you would expect would not be very highly cited, but is in fact very highly cited, that's really interesting. And in fact, that's more interesting than just finding out that it's highly cited. I think that's a really interesting insight that, that could be used uh, in other contexts to try to understand what underlies the skewed distribution. Because we know in any, for example, portfolio of patents, that however you measure it, the aggregate value of that portfolio comes from a tiny fraction of the elements in it. You, know, you could have hundreds or thousands of patents, and you would learn that all of the value of the portfolio lies in four of them. Um, and I think your idea of looking at outliers might help you get some leverage on, on that issue. And then metrics for universities. I don't know. I mean, I, I have another, I don't mean to be sitting up here um, pushing for my other papers, but I do have another paper that I did with some colleagues in Australia where we looked at the relationship between um, uh, uni looking at universities, the papers they publish, and we ask how often are those papers cited in patents as a measure of the sort of commercial impact of the research that's done in universities. And we related that to the various rankings that people do of universities. Uh, and uh, what we found is that in, if you look at institutions that are focused on the life sciences, that relationship is, is there. It's noisy, but it's there. And in other fields, it's essentially absent. There's essentially no relationship between uh, these rankings, if you take them as meaning something, uh, and and the commercial impact. So, subjective rankings would be one. It's kind of like the stock market of universities, hmm. I suppose. They have their own problems, but of course, the stock market does too. The stock market isn't a perfect. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we have uh, a, cu a couple of questions from the audience in YouTube. Uh, Catalina, you have. Uh, yeah, it's Francesco. from the colleague, it's Francesco Lisoni. <laughs> Uh, Francesco Lisoni is asking a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, Francesco, uh, we wish you were here, um, and uh, I'm going to read them, okay? So first, regards to Adam, it's a pity not being here. Uh, question two, how can fitness be told apart from preferential attachment in network technologies, especially patents on standards? Here, the value of patents depends straight from the number of other patents using the invention in standards. And then if you really think that preferential attachment matters more for scientific citations than from front page patent citations, I guess he's uh, referring to, to the non-patent literature. And as the former come from authors and the latter come from examiners, this is, uh, yeah. And why not compare in front page citations to in-text ones? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Francesco. As usual, um, good.
Good thoughts. Um, so, um, I, I haven't thought about your, your question about patents on standards, but, but let me reinterpret it slightly more broadly it, 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 as asking, aren't there cases where the value of a patent is just intrinsically how much is it connected to other things? And in that case, isn't preferential attachment sort of by definition the best measure of value? That's what I think I interpreted the question to mean. And um, that sounds probably right to me. I, I'm not really sure. It, I think it relates to my comment in answer to one of your points, Catalina, about the very nature of fitness being something that probably varies by technology field. And, and so this approach, because we're trying to be generic, we're looking for sort of a generic measure of fitness. And you could use my subsequent paper to criticize this paper and say, well, you've, you've shown that fitness really has to be measured in different ways for different technologies. Isn't it therefore bogus to use fitness the way we did in this paper? And my only excuse is time. We wrote this paper first and, and have the other paper. But I think, that's, I think that's the significance of that point, is that it really probably is true that you should think about fitness as something which is intrinsically has a different meaning in different technologies, and then that would matter. Um, on uh, the question about uh, in-text citations versus front page citations, let me first just be clear. I, I'm not sure if Francesco's comment um, suggests that I, this was unclear. When I made my observation that I think preferential attachment is more important for scientific papers than for patents, I was not talking about distinguishing the citations within patents, some of which go to patents and some of which go to scientific papers. That wasn't what I was talking about. What I was talking about is <clears throat> if you want to look at the world of science, and look at citations from papers to papers and think about the, the trade-off between preferential attachment and quality in that world, how might that compare to the world that I have studied, which was citations from patents to patents? That was my observation about the relative importance of um, preferential attachment and fitness. Now, Francesco has raised another point which is, is just another way in which this whole business gets very confusing, <laughs> which is that within patents, the patents don't just cite other patents. They also cite scientific papers. Uh, and within patents, there are two kinds of citations. There are citations which are uh, the examiner determines to be legally necessary and those appear on what's called the front page of the patents. So sh in shorthand, we call those front page citations. There are also, within the text of the patents, the description of the invention, um, there can appear citations to both scientific papers and to other patents which don't make it to the front page. And what that means is that the examiner determined that that citation was not legally necessary. Uh, no, nonetheless, the, the author, whoever drafted the patent, and that's not always clear, but whoever contributed to the drafting of the patent thought that it was useful to just mention this previous patent to understand what the current invention did. And I think Francesco is absolutely right that it would be interesting to look at those and to see my, my comments about preferential attachment and what it reflects from an information perspective would suggest that they should behave differently than the front page citations. And to broaden the discussion to like patent research, which at least three people in the world care about, um, what has happened in recent years is using natural language processing technology it has become much easier to identify the citations in the text systematically. We, this, my work was all based on the front page citations because they're computerized. Whereas as previously, the citations in the text, there was no database of them because they're messy. They're, they're just text. But a number of people have now applied 
uh, algorithms to that text and have extracted those citations in their papers that show just at a very broad level that the relationship, between, they're not the same, that the, the, the things that are cited in the text are a different set of things that are cited on the front page. So I think he's right that if you really want to dig deeper into this mess, <laughs> uh, looking, distinguishing the front page from the in-text citations, if you care about that detailed knowledge diffusion process, it would be very interesting. Thank you. I, I believe uh, we can ask uh, if someone here in the physical audience has a specific question. Anyone would like to raise a point of clarification? Okay. Then I, I will take the advantage of having the <laughs> role of moderator and try not to be moderated. Uh, I, I, I have one specific question that uh, you have uh, done in, in the in the paper that you have presented, you have uh, taken uh, one indicator, that is the number of inventors, and then you have uh, integrated that number uh, in, in a multidimensional dimension. And I'm, I'm guessing, based on what it, we know from bibliometrics, that the number of authors on, of papers is highly correlated with the number of citations. Uh, if you have explored the issue of the number of authors in connection with the uh, uh, with, with the quality uh, and the uh, uh, and the, uh, re the the effect in in the network, this is an, a, a question. And then uh, is a reflection connected with your last uh, thoughts. It's uh, is the role of uh, agents. This is a system, but to understand how the system works. We need to know what are the causal mechanisms, and those are determined in most of the cases by the system of agents interacting. And my point in relates to, uh, impartially to what uh, uh, Francesco was raising on the role of examiners, in specifically in the, in, in the issue of uh, patents. Uh, I think uh, uh, based on what I understood from the patent role, uh, the examiners played a very important role in, 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 the, in the diffusion and uh, in, in, in the demarcation, to say, to, uh, of the knowledge that is uh, transmitted and in determining the quality, too. Uh, biometrics usually do not consider uh, more than the author and those that mm. cite the paper, but we have some in a black box in the journals that are the reviewers. We have reviewers in the funding agencies and we ignore that the contribution of those reviewers. How can we think to, uh, it's, uh, let's say, it's open access in terms of making public the reviews as a contribution to the improvement under the, 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 the limitation of the knowledge could be used and thought uh, theoretically uh, to be integrated in the system? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, so I think Catalina suggested four different papers that could be written, and you've got three more, so <laughs> that'll keep me busy for a few years. Uh, but let me just uh, respond quickly. So you're right. Uh, in, in this literature, we, we talk about team size. So, so you could, the number of inventors listed on the patent is, is, is taken to be the size of the team that worked on the invention. And, in the realm of patents, that has some reality to it because they're illegal. It's at least in the U.S. I don't know so much in other countries. You have a legal obligation to correctly list uh, the, the people who contributed to the invention as inventors on the patent, both both omissions and frivolous additions to that list are grounds for uh, invalidating the patent. So. If you care at all about the property right you're trying to create, you have some incentive to, to have the right names uh, on the patent. And it is, it is uh, you, you said a, a strong correlation with citations. I might have moderated that slightly. They, they are correlated. I'm not sure I'd call it a strong correlation. They are correlated. And that's why we put it in the, in the kitchen sink, because we were trying to identify things that are known at the time the patent is granted that could be a reflection of the quality. Uh, now, um, you know, again, you could say, well, but maybe this, the fact that large teams produce inventions that are more highly cited has nothing to do with quality, but it's just another manifestation of the sort of uh, reputation, fandom aspect of citations. 
and so it shouldn't be there. Um, I guess my view, which I don't have proof for, is that in patent citations, at least these front page citations, it, it just seems less likely to me that that would be going on. So I, my interpretation of the team size citation correlation in patents is indeed that more complex inventions require more contribution and therefore they're more likely to be to have a big impact that it's like more input more output so i think of it as a real correlate not necessarily a causal but a correlate of the real significance of the invention the cost. that and the cost the resources that it's went the into it. yeah now the analog of that question in scientific research is also extremely interesting but is complicated then i do think by the question of if I've got 10 authors on the paper, do I generate more citations to that paper by the simple phenomenon that every one of those authors has an incentive to be telling other people about the paper? And maybe it gets cited more just because more people are talking about it. I mean, it nothing to do with intrinsic quality. So I think that that question in the science realm is, is even more complicated than in the patent realm. On your, 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 your comment about agents, are the source of causality in networks, and then you tied that to a comment about examiners and patents and their analog of reviewers uh, in the scientific realm, both reviewers of proposals and referees in papers and editors in papers. I agree with you completely, and, th and that's where I'd love to see more careful work being done and more, more real thinking about how these different kinds of agents in the network interact with each other. And what I will say is, in the last 15 years or so, as more data has become available about the role of the examiners in the patent system, really detailed data where you know which examiners worked on which patents and who assigned them to it and what group of other examiners do they sit with, some really interesting work has been done on how, you know, examiners are people. And, and really interesting work has been done on how they do affect the process. And you can identify examine, tough examiners and lenient examiners, and they are consistently so. And that, that has effects on what patents get granted. And I would be very surprised if similar things don't go on with the reviewers in the science system. The problem is you don't have as good data. Journals don't keep the kind of data that the patent office keeps in a systematic way, and they certainly don't make public the kind of data that the patent office makes public on the examiners. So, you know, that would be, how you do that research would be challenging, but I, my prediction would be if you could do it, it would tell you important things about those processes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, people in the, oh, sorry. Patricio Sai. Yeah, from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Thank you very much. Congratulations for your talk. Uh, this is a more general uh, question, perhaps, and more related, if not with research policy, with patent policy. And I am curious about your opinion. Uh, because patent citations are uh, increasingly used because they are available in the, uh, available in the, in the text from 1970s onwards, perhaps. But in certain or several markets for technology, as the, for instance, in the States, um, there are, in the last 20 years, new agents, eh, such as patent trolls or mm -hmm. patent thickets, uh, this kind of stuff that are managing, uh, I don't know, uh, thousands and thousands of patents in, as Russia managed their tanks, no? for, as weapons, for legal weapons to other companies. And this can influence the citations, the duration of the patent. How do you, what is your feeling about that? Because I, I remember Obama talking about recovering an old institution called working clause. Use it or lose it. It's my feeling. Uh, I have here a PhD candidate. I, I, do you want to yes. ask? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation also. And I, I want to ask you, uh, we work uh, on, on my PhD, we are working with uh, patent, data, patent data, 
and social network analysis. And there it is very important uh, on how many different technological fields a patentee is patenting. And uh, if I didn't mis misunderstood, uh, in this work, uh, you limited the the patent the citations to within one technological field each one and i want to ask you uh, why is this limited to the same uh, technological field it is for, for in in our works are very important to the different technological fields you are patenting on okay let me start with the last thing because that's the only thing you raised that's easy to to address so I may have misspoken or confused you. We are not limiting the citations to those that are within a given field. What we do is when we compare the rate of citation, we make that comparison only within a field. So when I talk about, you know, let's compare a patent with 10 citations compared to one that has three, I'm making that comparison only within, across patents that are from the same field. But when I'm identifying the citations, I include all citations. Uh, so I'm sorry if that was not clear. To go to the bigger set of issues that you've both raised, I think there's two, two parts, at least two parts to it. One is, what is the role of citations in these broader processes of interactions between inventions, including litigation and, and so forth? Uh, and then there's a second question, which is uh, one of patent policy about uh, are there things we should be doing that would make the patent system more effective in the face of some of these phenomenon of litigation and trolls and so forth. So let me, may, I hope that doesn't mischaracterize what you asked, but I'll take as, I'll, I'll interpret that to be the questions. And let me say briefly something about each of them. I think there is evidence that well, there is a there is a published paper, this time not by me, so I'm not pushing my own work. There is a published paper which came out in the RAND Journal either last year or the year before by um, uh, uh, Jeff Kuhn and um, oh, Kevin, Kevin Jungi from uh, EF, EPFL looking at citations over time. And they really show that, this, that, that sort of the information content of citation counts has been falling over time. And they argue that this is not, they don't, they don't argue that it's because of litigation, they argue it's basically because of the tremendous increase in the rate of patenting and in the, the number of patent, number of citations made per patent. So each, each patent that is now written or now granted is making more citations than they used to make and uh, they argue that this is sort of lowering the information content of citations. So I think there is some evidence that citations as a metric, at least within the patent world, is, it, their information content is declining. Uh, now, we had an interesting conversation last night about, um, but what's replacing it is text analysis. So what we now have is you may not be able to identify which are the important patents based on counting their citations, but increasingly, you can identify the important patents by the relationship between the text of the patents and the text of subsequent citations. And I said at dinner last night that my prediction is 10 years from now, no one will be counting citations. Because once we really thoroughly figure out how to exploit the ability to analyze all of the words in the patent, that will, that will supersede citation now. Now, to go to your second question about uh, changing patent law and, for example, a use it or lose it sort of requirement, complicated, uh, complicated. Uh, within the US, at least, my sense is that the, what we might call the patent troll problem and the frivolous litigation problem uh, is, is diminishing people's perception of its significance. It was in, around 2010, there was sort of a peak in how wrought people, people were about that issue, and that has fallen off a little bit. Um, I, I think there are some changes that are no-brainers. Uh, my, my personal, whenever I'm asked one change in the patent system, there's one that I think has all benefits and no costs, which is we should require everyone who owns a patent to reveal publicly to the patent office 
and record with the patent office every time it changes who really owns that patent. Uh, now that has some relationship to the patent troll problem, but it has a much broader relationship, which is that if you're trying to, if you have an idea for something you want to work on, you want to know who am I up against, who's, who might come after me, uh, and uh, uh, allege infringement, whether I've infringed or not. And as things stand today, you actually can't figure that out in many cases. And I see no benefit of that. I don't see how that advances any public good. I think the use it or lose it is tricky. The analogy I always use is, you know, if you own a piece of land, we don't tell you that you can't just hold it for its option value, that you have to build a building on it or it's going to get taken away from you. And, and I think to some extent that could apply to, to intellectual property rights as well. I, I, I do understand why it's frustrating, given that we want patents to be generating social benefit, um, that, that uh, you can get a patent on something and then just sit on it. Um, my view is most of the real problems that people point to connected to that are the real problem is something else. The, the real problem is, is it was a it shouldn't have been granted to begin with, or um, I think there is an issue with patents on research tools, um, which I think unfortunately have been, it used to be in the US there was a general presumption that research tools were not patentable, and there was a court decision that basically got rid of that, uh, and I think that was probably unfortunate. But anyway, complicated. One interesting thing, and you didn't say, is that you work with, they work with historical patent data, uh -huh. current data. <laughs> well, then you're probably in better, on better ground using citations, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, it's uh, one minute uh, already passed, but there are uh, more questions. Okay. Adriana Hill from the Ministry of Science and Innovation. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm a physicist myself, so I, I'm a fan of modeling systems. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if it would make sense to correlate uh, these models with another parameter which might be difficult to, to know, to get data from, which is the, the money mm. that companies are paying for specific patents because all the models you are working on are kind of uh, theoretical or in the in the uh, scenario of indicate of, of bibliometrics but in the real world a patent is valuable or not because someone is paying money for it yeah. and giving profit out of it is there any correlation expected so in these two <laughs> so scenarios so you're my favorite kind of physicist. You're a physicist who thinks like an economist. So, <laughs> um, you know, this is something that, that we economists who work with patent data have struggled with over the years. The answer is no, there really isn't very much data because there's no system or law that requires that kind of payment to be reported. Uh, I mentioned briefly, or you probably already forgotten it, in my talk that citations are correlated with the auction value of of patents. Well, it turns out that statement is based on one paper which used data from one year of auctions uh, that they got access to, uh, and then the, the entity that was carrying out the auctions figured out that it was not in their commercial interest to share such information, so no one's been able to reproduce it or update it or do any more of it. So, you know, it's it, it, you're absolutely right that that you know the, the, the if if you if you were asked to say what's the most what would be the most valuable kind of data to get about patents it would be uh, licensing fees or or, or resale values uh, uh, but we have only very limited amounts of such data because the people who have that information typically don't want to share it and there's nothing that makes them share it. Okay. Uh, another question. Let's take uh, five more minutes. Javier Echave from the Vice Presidency uh, of uh, Knowledge Transfer. Okay. 
Hi, thank you, Adams, for your presentation. Maybe the, the the money obtained by the patents is very complex to to know, or maybe be access to that. But maybe in, in the USA uh, Patent Office, could be possible the now what patent has been licensed or not? Because for us, the the first point for to declare to to say this patent has is a quality uh, high quality level is is licensed or not yeah. is the first is the first step of the of the way to transfer a put a product a process in the market and then for us is enough uh, information about licensed or not maybe it could be more no, that, that's more, a, e more easier yeah. to obtain this data that, that's a very uh, you know, uh, important and <clears throat> sensible uh, suggestion. In the U.S., it is not uh, required under patent law to to uh, sort of notify anyone about licenses. There, there is. It's. It, it neither is it required uh, to notify the patent office if the patent is sold outright to another entity. You. There is a. Uh, a um, directory with the patent office maintains that you can voluntarily report a transfer of ownership. To my knowledge, there is no directory that the patent office maintains even a voluntary one of licensing. Um, I made the observation a minute ago about why I think that requiring the ownership of the property right to be it, that it be required that that be public information. I, that I thought that was there's no real good argument against that. I think the licensing thing. While I would agree with you, it would probably be a good thing if if all licenses had to be recorded. I think that would be even more controversial, and there would be more of an argument that you don't really have a right to that information. Uh, so I think it would be harder. I, you know, if if I I, I was I'd say to my kids. Uh, so what would, you know, they, they like to complain about something. I'd say, okay, if you were dictator of the universe, what would you do uh, to solve the problem? If I were dictator of the universe, I would probably make all license, require all licensing contracts to be public. But I don't know that that's something that uh, we can really expect, you know, we're going to get out of the politicians. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, no more questions, uh, only to thank, well, thank you, you all very much. Adam, this was lots of fun. for your contribution, yes. yeah, and Jesus, fun. Marco, and Catalina for the comments. And I think we are done. We can finish. Thank you to the moderator and to <laughs> the audience here and online. <laughs>